Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is going to be the first group, the first tier of the uh, Dare to be Great 2 vendor hall sessions, and this is going to be the Diamond Sponsor Group. I am here with my buddy, Caleb Branch, and he is the Alabama Market Manager within Digital. He's going to be doing a session today uh, on network analytics and visibility. Take it away, my friend. Hey, thank you, Ricardo. And good morning, everybody. We are certainly glad to have you here on what is the, I guess, the first official day of the Dare to be Great conference, uh, day two overall. And uh, what a neat, neat platform uh, to be able to share a little bit about what's going on in the industry, uh, to give you some ideas, what you might do differently in your PSAP, and then also to show or highlight uh, what different vendors are doing uh, in uh, in the time during COVID, as well as uh, the different type of uh, the different type of uh, innovation that's come to the in industry. So my task today is to talk to you a little bit about network analytics and visibility, uh, and we're going to do that hopefully uh, in an interactive fashion, as well as in a uh, hopefully something that'd be meaningful to you going forward uh, if you choose to analyze an event or look at some call data that may help you address staffing or um, you know, seek more funding for your particular PSAP. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about myself because I, I think maybe this will anchor uh, what I say a little bit later on. I have always been in public safety. So my first job out of high school um, was as a part time dispatcher call taker at a very rural 911 center here in Alabama and really enjoyed that job. So enjoyed the technology. Uh, and also got to you know interact one on one with people that were having a terrible day, in many cases, the worst day of their life and took some lessons from that experience and uh, realized that I, I wanted to continue on in public safety, maybe in a different uh, capacity. So went to paramedic school and graduated uh, and went to work immediately on an ambulance while still working part time as a dispatcher. And I found a, a picture of myself there from uh, several years ago at a training exercise uh, of me, young and beardless, uh, fresh out of paramedic school, um, you know, as as uh, kind of getting my feet wet uh, in, in that side of public safety. So on one side of the radio uh, as a dispatcher and then on the other side uh, as a responder in the field. So continued on my career, I managed ambulance service for a while and then uh, very fortunately at 24 years old, uh, a group in northeastern uh, northeastern Alabama, specifically in Blount County, uh, hired me to be the director of a consolidated center there. So you see part of my staff there spent five years at Blount County 911 here in Alabama uh, as the director. We did a building project. We did a consolidation project. We did a cab project. Uh, the only thing that uh, we didn't do, I think, that's on the, the list of the big things you should do is a radio project. And I think they've got one of those underway now. And so uh, then had the opportunity two years to, uh, two years ago to come work for InDigital uh, as the market manager over the uh, ESI net deployment here in Alabama that uh, is more commonly known as the Angin network or the Alabama Next Generation Emergency Network. So we're almost at full network deployment here in the state. And um, it's really been a very fun experience as we uh, seek to make call delivery more reliable uh, here in the state, as well as give a more robust feature set to the PSAPs. Uh, I've been uh, a nerd, was born a nerd, uh, and really enjoy the opportunity to innovate here at InDigital, as well as be able to serve uh, the PSAPs who serve the public. So it's been a, been a really fun time. But my task today is to talk to you a little bit about some events that have happened here in Alabama and how the tools at uh, our disposal uh, here with a statewide ESI net deployment have been uh, incredibly helpful in analyzing those events. So that's what we will do today. We're going to talk about legacy versus next generation 911 data collection. Uh, so from the network level versus from the local level. Then we'll talk about some actual events that happened, uh, whether that be man-made or natural. We will uh, discuss briefly visual data in uh, a support capacity for planned events, whether that be a race, a football game, or some other large scale event. And then finally, we'll review and, and you can ask any questions that you might have. So again, appreciate you joining me this morning. So let's talk about data uh, 
prior to uh, next generation versus next generation 911. So in a traditional 911 environment, uh, you may only be able to collect data from just your call handling system. And we're curious to know how you're currently collecting data. In fact, as uh, Ricardo alluded to, there are two poll questions uh, that you have the opportunity to answer because uh, we want to know how you collect and, and use that data. So in a legacy environment, you only have the ability to see that data once it comes in your PSAP or once it hits your call handling systems controller or ingress gateway. In a next generation environment, we can see that call as it transgresses the network all the way from the legacy network gateway at the level uh, of the, uh, the carrier handoff or when it comes in across the board control function uh, into our network, uh, our network architecture. So we have this full ability to see from where the call starts to where the call terminates and that being with the dispatcher who hangs up um, after they've uh, given the person the help or the assistance that they need. So it's this, this wide data set that maybe previously uh, there wasn't the ability to be able to tap into. And in digital, we use that, uh, that data set to populate a program we refer to as 911 Logics. Uh, 911 Logics is uh, our management information system that gives us the ability to see network health and uh, to make sure that our functional elements inside our network are working properly. But in addition to that, there's a PSAP facing side of 911 Logics that gives um, each PSAP on the network the ability to be able to look at their call data real time uh, over a web browser and then pull data from that if they choose to analyze it further and more deeply where they're on screen uh, using that program or in another program like Excel or Tableau. So a really cool program uh, that we are able to offer uh, at a, a state deployment level. We can also offer it at an individual PSAP level uh, as well. So just because you're not on a large ESI net doesn't mean that you can't have this type of data at your disposal. So it gives you real time views, network analytics, as well as uh, information on your call handling. And then finally, it's a very secure platform uh, that requires dual factor authentication. So that's a little bit about Logix. As you can see, Logix is over my shoulder here on my TV here in my office. Um, those pins are actually a reflection of 911 calls that have occurred in the state. I know that's a little far away, so you may not be able to see it. Um, in addition to that, we have a weather overlay as well as, uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the events of the last eight months, a COVID overlay and, and then a heat map that gives uh, very specific uh, information for the last 24 hours concerning uh, call trends in particular areas. So. All right, let's, let's actually dive into some real life events and uh, see what we can do to, uh, to pull some data out of them. And then I'll just talk through this with you. Um, I think that we could talk a lot about the platform, but I'd rather just tell you a story uh, about several different things that occurred. So let's start with a real man-made event uh, that occurred uh, just a little while ago on July the 3rd, 2020 at the River Chase Gallery. Uh, what you see on the screen is from Logix. It's an export into uh, to Excel that I uh, went ahead and did some, some data digging on. Uh, normally, Hoover uh, 911 during the 3 p.m. hour receives somewhere between 3 and, and 11 911 calls in that 3 p.m. hour. Notice that um, the shooting that uh, ended up, unfortunately, killing a, a eight-year-old boy um, resulted in 89 911 calls from that mall in a very short period of time. So in just a, a very compressed uh, amount of time. In fact, Hoover's 911 volume was up 86% over the previous, uh, the previous um, time period of the previous day. So on the second, you see uh, that there are about 13 911 calls for that same hour. An incredibly tragic event, but not only were we able in real time to pull this data uh, because we have a network deployment, Hoover 911, uh, you know, had to had to send some of those calls to another place uh, because that's a that's a significant call volume. And so our network was able to to move those calls to an adjacent PSAP uh, 
specifically the ones that couldn't be answered immediately by Hoover 911. So what does that look like from a uh, just kind of a, a call plot or a call graph perspective? So this is the XY export um, out of Logix and then uh, on a base map that uh, give you a little better idea of, of the structures surrounding uh, the mall there as well as the time frame. So what you see here is a cluster of calls. The cluster of calls are in green. The cluster of calls is where the shooting took place. That is the food court. Um, I will say that we were uh, pretty impressed by the, uh, the amount of phase two data that came in from that. Historically here in the state, we have had uh, a problem with phase two data. That was not the case with this and we were able to very quickly identify where the actual shooting was taking place. And then you see the rest of the phase two data surrounding uh, the actual event place, as well as the wireline call volume uh, represented in blue, and then the three or four calls that came in that were phase one represented in orange. So we were immediately able to understand that there was a significant event happening at the River Chase Galleria, and then within the network architecture, ensure that all those calls were able to be met in a timely fashion. So just a, a, a really unfortunate event on the day before Independence Day, uh, but one that we had uh, visibility into. So that is something that actually happened. Uh, this is something that did not happen, but was re reported uh, by the local television station to be a uh, an active shooter on the base at Fort Rucker Military Installation on the day after Thanksgiving 2018. So we were in the middle of network deployment then, and uh, the local television station said there's an active shooter on the base uh, there at Fort Rucker. So I started uh, I was sitting on my couch actually at home, started to, uh, to log into Logix and look around and did not see any call volume on the base and uh, called one of the developers of our, our software set here and said, hey, I think there's nothing wrong with Logix. I can't see, I can't see any data uh, as related to, to, this, uh, to this event. And he said, no, the data is the data. I, I don't see anything happening there. So what would uh, turn out to be is that about six hours prior to that notification by the media, there was a domestic incident that occurred that caused the... Uh, uh, I think a nephew to shoot maybe his uncle and uh, injure him. And then somehow that story got twisted into to something other than it was. So this might be uh, more accurately uh, fake news uh, because nothing really happened there. And the data was able to um, the data was able to really drive that conversation and better understand if if an actual event uh, that needed responding to was occurring. So, so another event that I like to talk about because I think it does show the value of law enforcement. Law enforcement is uh, under significant attack here uh, in parts of America. But I'll take you to Lad People Stadium in uh, Mobile, Alabama from August the 30th of last year. So this is August the 30th of 2019. A gunman opened fire in one of the mezzanine levels uh, of the, the stadium there. Um, where nine people ended up being shot and one person was arrested. From the time the gunman opened fire to the time that he was apprehended by law enforcement was around 30 seconds. So imagine gunman opens fire, law enforcement is already on the scene protecting uh, the area because of the football game that was going on there. And they uh, had their hands on the gunman uh, and were able to non-lethally uh, detain him in a very short period of time because they were there. So even though nine people were shot and uh, several people were were injured, uh, it only resulted in about six 911 calls related to that event. So really a remarkable depiction of how police presence uh, does uh, seek to not only lower the incidence of 911 calls, but hopefully prevented further people uh, from being injured or even potentially killed. So another event uh, that was man-made was uh, from from this year. So the May the 30th and the 31st of of 2020, and this is specifically related to some riots and civil unrest uh, related to uh, a statue removal in Birmingham, and then the Black Lives Matter movement in Hoover, and. This is a depiction of, of two different things. So if you look at this map, uh, 
what we wanted to do was pull call volume data in downtown Birmingham from the week prior uh, at from 3 p.m. to 4.30. And then the, the current day when the, the riots, the protests were actively occurring from, uh, I'm sorry, from 3 to 6 a.m. So this is data a week apart um, from downtown. And you see just the, the presence of people, right? Because people called 911. Uh, related to this protest that, that eventually turned riotous, and then um, and then the data from the previous week. And so what does that look like from a 911 center perspective? So Birmingham 911's call volume was up by 91% uh, over uh, the previous week. And, and you see, so I have the Saturdays and Sundays uh, listed here in orange and then in green, the significant increase over even the previous uh, Sunday. So we were able to watch that call volume in real time. Uh, the Nile One Center obviously had access to our, our, our software set there to be able to analyze, um, you know, what was occurring, as well as the adjacent 911 Center um, was able to analyze uh, what was occurring because we were under the belief for a period of time that due to the location um, of Birmingham 911, it would potentially have to evacuate and move somewhere else. This is a comparison there from Birmingham and Hoover. Hoover is an adjacent city to uh, Birmingham and it also had a uh, uh, some protests that were not as violent, uh, more widespread long term, but not as violent. And you see their call volume had, uh, had increased by 16%. So that's a little bit about man-made uh, man-made events, things that uh, that have happened over really the last year and a half or two years that I just I, I try to analyze and and understanding a little bit better uh, about call volume and how that relates to what is actually occurring. But now I'd like to talk about um, a, a very recent event as well as uh, a tornado outbreak here in the state as well. So as many of you know, Hurricane Sally um, actually came ashore middle of uh, middle of last September or middle of September, so last month. And it caused um, particularly a lot of damage to Baldwin County, Alabama. And so what does that look like from a network view? Let me show you. This is uh, this is Hurricane Sally. And this video may not play. There we go. This is Hurricane Sally as viewed from Logix. As it comes on shore, notice when it touches the tip of Baldwin County there in the uh, far southwest corner of Alabama, the call volume, and then as it dissipates into a tropical storm and then a depression over central Alabama, uh, really what that looks like there. It's a, it's a pretty impressive video, and I'll show you it again. Uh, this is all real-time data as captured from Logix, and you can see call volume increase there in the top left just tremendously uh, once it comes on shore. So we knew that Baldwin County specifically had an issue with flooding, uh, as well as an infrastructure issue there. We were very proud to report that we were able to deliver all 911 calls to Baldwin County 911, uh, which was a, a big deal for us because part of their infrastructure and power, um, as well as, as Ethernet uh, and network connectivity went down. So we were, um, because the way we've architected our network there, we were able to deliver all calls. Really cool video, but what does that mean in terms of call volume? So this is what uh, this is what Baldwin County now one's call volume looks like for from 6 p.m. on the 8th of uh, of September to the 10th at what it looks like to be 7 a.m. versus when the hurricane came ashore on the 15th uh, of September. It was an incredibly busy time uh, for that PSAP. Uh, they were overran with 911 calls. This is probably the busiest they've ever been in the most sustained form uh, you're talking about. I don't know, I think I've got, I think that's something where, somewhere around 36 hours worth of data there uh, of them in some cases being up um, 15, or 1,500% above uh, what they would normally receive in a, a given period of time. So just a busy time. Um, because of that, we were uh, we had to alternately route some of their 911 calls because it was just impossible to answer all of them, and we were able to analyze that data too. So these calls were answered by an adjacent PSAP, uh, and then the help was given that they needed in that period of time. So 
And if you look across um, what that means for Baldwin County, which is on the east side of the Mobile Bay versus uh, increased call volume on the west side of the Mobile Bay in Mobile County, Mobile County 911 did not experience the amount of uh, call volume increase that Baldwin did. So there was uh, much more damage and destruction in Baldwin County than in Mobile. Again, all of that was real time and all of that was um, kind of at our, our disposal to be able to uh, to look at and to to go back and kind of review not only with the PSAP, but also with our partners at the state uh, as they sought to understand more fully how a uh, an impact or how how a event of that magnitude impacted 911 operations there. Uh, a couple more examples of that uh, that I think are pretty interesting, one of which is from uh, the 19th of January of 2019. And this is just a storm system that moved across the state. And we were able to see very actually for the first time, because this was very shortly after uh, we'd reached uh, full network deployment, how call volume affected was affected by severe weather. And I've got another example of that. Um, coming up in a little bit. Uh, but on the left here, uh, you see a tweet from the National Weather Service in Birmingham highlighting two separate tornado events. Uh, the one here on the left, this is a EF1, I believe, in uh, Vera Rule, Otago County. And this is a, another tornado, that I think it's EF2, uh, in uh, Elmore County in a more populated area. So nobody lives here. Many people live here, and as a result of that, the sheriff's office there had a 340% call volume increase as compared to only a 10% call volume increase uh, for an adjacent county and an adjacent event. So, so call, uh, call volume there was an indicator of damage uh, and is also, uh, you know, goes to further, uh, you know, I guess, reinforce um, how that, you know, it's very difficult to be able to uh, to further understand or even really uh, contemplate damage without having a good data set. And so that's what we have here. Another thing, this has been a, a crazy year here uh, in Alabama between COVID and then the, the severe weather that we have had in the state uh, and just some other things that have gone on, civil unrest, this is a, a video of Easter Sunday from this past year and a tornado outbreak that occurred. Notice uh, the tornado is about right here and you can see um, you can see call volume uh, significantly increase as as people call 911 uh, related to um, related to that event. So this is a pretty telling video from Logix uh, that we were able to put together that really shows just how busy things get. Uh, in a um, in a disaster scenario or in a severe weather outbreak scenario. Um, very comprehensive in its data set here, and it gives us uh, a little better insight into what the PSAT was going through there as well. So what does that look like from a uh, from a network perspective? I've got I've got two separate uh, data points here. The one on the left is uh, just a total call count across the network here in Alabama on Sundays. So notice that uh, the 12th of April, which was Easter Sunday, call volume was up significantly over the previous Sunday, but only up marginally over the second busiest Sunday uh, in the last five reporting days, which was the 15th of March. Uh, the most impacted 911 centers across the network are the ones that you see on the right-hand side. Um, Three PSAPs here you see have a call volume that increased by over 100% as related to that. So just a way to kind of go in, look at that, and maybe better understand what we're talking about. And finally, I want to talk about one of the most tragic events that has happened in Alabama since, um, really since April the 27th of 2011. So on April the 27th of 2011, uh, I was on an ambulance in uh, Oxford, Alabama, working as a paramedic, and uh, the death and destruction that I saw that day, I thought that I would never see again. I thought that would be a generational event uh, where over 200 people lost their lives that day. 
And, and it, that truly was a generational event, but another terrible event happened on March the 3rd of 2019 in Lee County, Alabama, where 23 people were killed and uh, over $100 million worth of damage was done as a, uh, as a very large tornado moved from county line, uh, essentially to county line in Lee County um, on that day. So I want to compare that with uh, a simultaneous event that was going on at the time. Uh, and that was an EF1 tornado in Macon County. So this over here where you see Tuskegee and South uh, all the way over, this is Macon County. So this yellow is a, an EF1 tornado. And then up here, this is Lee County. This red uh, line is the EF4 that we'll talk about a little later on. So what does a tornado look like from our software suite logics? Well, this is it. So on the left, you see the 911 calls that are attributed to that particular tornado that I showed you the track of. And then on the right, you see what the tornado looks like from satellite radar out of Montgomery. So this was the busiest hour for Macon County 911. It was um, only marginally busy than the second busiest hour. If you note my, my stats here on the 3rd of, uh, 3rd of March, they had 18 calls in that hour their next busiest hour was uh all the way back in june or in january january the 6th at 1 p.m when they had a an hour in which they received 14 now one calls the cf1 produced no loss of life minimal property damage and only a slight increase in call volume so let's contrast that yellow uh ef1 with a ef4 tornado that as you see touched boundary to boundary in lee county so this is what uh, the tornado looks like from satellite or from radar, uh, the Montgomery radar site. I was actually on my couch at home, captured this data loop. And if you know anything about radar, you understand that um, anytime your reflectivity turns this tan color that is indicative of debris being aloft up to 15,000 feet, more specifically in this scenario is indicative of 28 people losing their lives. So a really sad day and a day that uh, overwhelmed the local 911 center there in Lee County. Uh, you know, I think they normally staff four to five people, uh, but during that 2 p.m. hour, specifically between 2.45 and 3 p.m., they received over 100 911 calls for help. And then in that next hour, they received an additional 49 calls for help directly related to the tornado that occurred. This is rural Alabama. Um, that is a lot of people calling 911 from, from rural Alabama. Um, normally, Lee County Sheriff's Office is the 21st busiest 911 center in Alabama. That day, it was the 6th. It, um, it was busier than, than many large places in the state. Just a sad day for us and a day that, you know, I was watching Logics while this was occurring, and we saw, we saw it as, as it was happening. So... So we've talked about man-made events. We've talked about natural disasters. And uh, now I'd like to talk about visual data as decision support. And we'll uh, give you some examples of that. So in Alabama, we do not have a professional baseball team. We do not have a professional basketball team. And some would say we don't have a professional football team. Uh, but we do have a racetrack and a very famous racetrack, the Talladega Super Speedway in East Central Alabama. And so what, what we wanted to do is we wanted to analyze uh, race weekend to hopefully give um, better data to the 911 center there, as well as help them um, with responder staffing and deployment and uh, help them better understand maybe where they could, uh, they could hopefully uh, put responders so that uh, you know, next time they can more more adequately and accurately meet the needs of those that came to the race. So what you see here is a map of that race weekend. Notice the 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 large race, the um, the cup race is on on the Sunday, so that's going to be on the 28th of of April. And then you have the the two previous days, Saturday and Friday. So Friday is in red, Saturday is in yellow, and then Sunday is in blue. Most of the calls, believe it or not, came during the large event. I mean, that, that's kind of common sense. The large event was on Sunday. Most of the 911 calls on the race grounds came on Sunday. Uh, but as we, as we kind of dove into that, 
call volume into the 911 center there uh, did not even make the list for the busiest times into that 911 center. Three of the five busiest hours were related to the race, but not the busiest hour. The second busiest hour was at Sunday's race conclusion after everybody has had a great time at the race and gets ready to go home and maybe either uh, has some type of incident or accident or, or something. That was the second busiest time for that year for, um, for Talladega 911. The fourth busiest hour was the hour leading up to the big race on Sunday. So when everybody's coming, right, when there's a, uh, an exodus of people either you know, away from the racetrack or when everybody's coming uh, for the race, that's when the most calls come in. So before and after. It uh, just kind of seeks to verify some things that are are really common sense and and what you would probably what you would probably go ahead and and guess was the case. Uh, in addition to that, you know, if we're if we're thinking about other events, you know, the race is a very concentrated event, right? That's that's a weekend specifically one day in which call volume may be affected one way or the other. Well, what about a longer event? So when we thought that we would be experiencing uh, a pandemic, you know, a generational pandemic, right? The last one that we we had was around 1917. We took it as an opportunity to to look at call data uh, for, for our state deployments, whether that be, you know, uh, Indiana or Michigan or uh, parts of New England or, or here in Alabama and to see how the pandemic affected call volume. I didn't pull the rest of that. I have the rest of that data, but for some reason I forgot to put it in here. The the thing that we noticed uh, for, you know, from, from the time that we were told that potentially we we're going to have a pandemic, which is around the 23rd of February, until the time at which the state went into lockdown, we did see a call volume increase, right? And then we saw a call volume decrease, and that call volume decrease stayed um, really pretty consistent up until uh, up until I, th I think it was uh, Memorial Day weekend in May. And then we see their call volume go back up. So what what we took that to mean was that, you know, people were actually you know, staying at home. They were uh, they were isolating at their house until uh, the, the lockdown was over. And and since then, we've seen call volume just return to normal. Um, really since July the 4th specifically. So just a way to, to analyze other events. But to kind of to kind of bring this around and talk a little bit further about how to plan for planned events, whether it be a race or or even a pandemic, which has a such a long period of time uh, to finally something like a large football game, whether that be LSU versus Alabama or in a little bit, we'll talk about the Iron Bowl. The LSU versus Alabama game last year was a very important game for multiple reasons, right? The SEC West was on the line there, uh, as well as there was going to be a presidential visit. So what we did was we sought to, to look at how a presidential visit affects uh, call volume and then also um, just overall call volume of the game. So, so we see here... Uh, Green calls are calls during the game and red calls are after the game. They are pretty well distributed. Um, most calls actually occurred uh, before the game. That That's something that we would have not thought, that, that most of the calls actually occurred before kickoff. Kickoff was at 2.30. This is the, uh, was the CBS game that week. Uh, only 27% of calls occurred during the game and 25% occurred after the game. The two hot spots of call activity are the stadium. No surprise there. That's where the people gathered. And then Denny Chimes and the quad up here uh, where much of the tailgating goes on. So that's that's a little bit of information about just the game itself. Now let's talk about the presidential visit. So Air Force One uh, flew in to the Tuscaloosa National Airport and then made its way into or the motorcade made its way to uh, to Bryant Denny Stadium here as depicted in the map. So this is all the call data that we have that you saw in the previous map. And this is just an adjusted focus uh, for a presidential motorcade route. The thing that we learned out of this is there is not one 911 call that was uh, that was sent along the presidential motorcade route, whether 
and it's ingress or egress. Uh, not one person called 911 within uh, several hundred feet, almost a thousand feet uh, of where that motorcade was. Just that's that's very interesting. I guess you can you can kind of take from that what you will. But as we were as we were evaluating that, that was the data point that stuck out to me. So and, and by the way, LSU won that game. I'm a Bama fan and, and LSU came to Tuscaloosa uh, and, and won that game. And it was very unfortunate and everybody was really upset. And so we're going to talk about another Bama loss here. Uh, and that would be the 2019 Iron Bowl, uh, the yearly event in which Auburn faces Alabama. This year it was at Jordan-Hare Stadium or pa this past year it was at Jordan-Hare Stadium uh, in Auburn, Alabama. So we see kind of a similar thing here uh, in terms of call volume. Uh, most of the calls actually occurred before the game, just like in Tuscaloosa uh, in, uh, in Auburn. Most of the calls occurred before the game and uh, with the least amount of calls occurring after the game was over. The, the two hot spots of call activity are uh, the stadium, obviously, and then uh, in and around Tumor's Corner, uh, the – the thing there is, so Timbers Corner is kind of like the main, you know, where the main thoroughfare is for uh, for the city of Auburn. It's also where they have like a post game celebration uh, because Alabama lost to Auburn. Auburn celebrated at Tumors, and that's where uh, there was a hot spot of call activity. So nothing, nothing must be gained from there. Uh, notice that there were actually some calls, and this is during the game, but this is directly after the game here in the middle of the field. Uh, so Auburn rushed the field. They were so happy they beat Alabama that they rushed the field, uh, tore up some hedges, and as a result of that, uh, several people called 911 because they had hurt themselves trying to rush the field. So roll tight. <laughs> um, this is what this looks like. Uh, the city of Auburn's uh, PSAP was incredibly busy that day, right? So that's a college town, fairly small college town. But when you have the, the largest event that occurs in the state um, at any one point in time other than the race occur, it gives you the um, kind of the ability to look and see at call volume trends. This is a direct pull from Logix. Notice how busy they were uh, on, on game day and really game weekend as opposed to any of the rest of the month. So by far the busiest time uh, of day or the time of, of, of the month uh, for the city of Auburn, peace out. So, all right, uh, that is pretty well my presentation on just some data that we've collected, uh, trying to analyze now one call volume and see what the data tells us about three different types of events, man-made uh, as well as pre-planned and then natural events. It has been a uh, an honor to be with you uh, today. We we really do seek at in digital to be able to provide um, more information that is good uh, for the PSAP in terms of data collection, but also better service uh, and a higher level of uh, of redundancy and resiliency than than what you maybe previously have experienced. And so we we do hope that um, if you do have a need. For us, if you like any more information, please contact me. Uh, my email address is cbranch at indigital.net. Uh, we certainly would be happy to uh, to look into any questions or uh, or just help you in any way that we can. We we seek to serve you, uh, the PSAP. Um, that's one of the things I love about working at Indigital is that we every day wake up and um, see what we can do to make things better, right? Because what's good today can be better tomorrow and then also what we can better do to serve uh, and help uh, those who answer the 911 call. So cbranchedindigital.net is my email address. I think Ricardo will hop back on here in a little bit. I don't see any questions, do you? Hey, hey. Hello. Excellent work as always, man. I'm gonna bring this, uh, your PowerPoint down here really quick so then it's just you and I. Uh -huh. uh, so I like how you added in also, you know, the uh, the sports love and stuff. And you got in the comments here a couple of people going back and forth. <laughs> Excellent work. That was good stuff. I wanted to read you um, the polls here. So while we okay. were, while you were going through some more 
uh, poll information popped up. So the first one that uh, that you had put in here was, have you ever used call data to analyze an event? And eight votes for yes. So there were there was overwhelmingly yes. And well, now it's changing. Now there's yes and no. Yes is still ahead at 80% there. So um, yeah, for, for those who are joining us here, uh, you know, in the middle of the session, and all, there are polls that are in there and you can check those out. And it looks like for the other one, what software did you use to analyze the event? Um, two votes went to uh, call handling system analytics, and then uh, two went to third party. Um, and then now it looks like five. So we're, we're leading with 55.6% for raw data from the call handling system. So what do you take from either one of those? You know, I'm not sure other than to say that I think there's work to be done to to better, you know, get better visibility, if nothing else, into actual events that occur. And so whether you use logics or something else, my encouragement to you is to to get that get that data. If, if you need my help, I'm happy to act as a resource because, you know, in some cases I, I know that we would we would love for you to have logics. But in some cases, just thinking through in a tabular fashion what data you have. Uh, it would be beneficial to your piece app so. right yeah for sure like it, it it takes me back to when i was uh in dispatch and we would have the uh the teletype uh <laughs> you know the uh the, the the paper coming up i can't even dot matrix that's what it is yeah the, dot matrix print printouts yeah the dot matrix printouts coming out and i remember um one of my co-workers there she's the training coordinator now uh there at Allegan central dispatch in michigan but um, she would say, I would say, what is all this, you know, all this crap that I'm looking at? She goes, oh, they're just, they're just numbers from the call, uh, printouts. And, and I said, so this is just data that we're looking at. She's like, yeah. And I said, it's, I remember saying it's kind of boring. It's like, it's just numbers here. Like, I wish there was more to it. And, and, and this, everything that you're talking about, this is exactly what I was talking about back then saying this stuff is boring, but this makes it look so much cooler. You can visualize that data and really put, you know, a kind of a story to it as well. So one of the things that we did when I worked at as a paramedic uh, on an ambulance is we had a paper. We didn't have CAD and this has not been that long ago. We had a, a paper log book that had addresses as well as call types. And so one day I was apparently bored. Uh, <laughs> I, I took a week's worth of data mm -hmm. and then figured out like so, you know, figured out the addresses and that type of thing and call volume type. And then made a little map about where the call, and nobody was impressed with that map other than me. But you know, you can do it even if you have a paper log. It just takes mm -hmm. maybe a little longer. So that's cool, man. So we've got uh, yeah a lot of praise coming in here for the session and everything that you do there in the state of Alabama. Um, again, um, in, in the comments, I, I actually put uh, Caleb's uh, email address in there as well. If you guys ever have any questions, comments, or anything definitely reach out to Caleb. He knows his stuff and with everything that he's doing with all of the market managers, really. And uh, I mean, you're, you're the subject matter expert there for, for logics and analytics and everything. So I don't know what that says about the subject, <laughs> but it's good stuff though. I mean, I, I dig it. You presented well and it is awesome, man. So thank you very much for joining us and for everyone in the session. The next session coming up is going to be the uh, gold sponsor tier. And that is going to be with the Denise Amber Lee foundation. So I will see you all over there. Thank you once again, Caleb, and I'll be talking to you guys soon. Thanks everyone.